Hey y'all and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about post-obstructive diuresis. This is, I think, the third uh, third kind of spin-off video. So we started with our case conference a few days ago uh, on an elderly gentleman uh, with distal urinary tract obstruction leading to severe acute renal failure. Um, resolved with Foley catheter placement, he then went into significant post-obstructive diuresis requiring intensive care unit admission. Um, we then talked about obstructive uropathy in the preceding video. Video, and now we're going to dive into post-obstructive diuresis. So this will be somewhat of a quicker video, but it's an interesting topic, one that uh, um, we don't often come across clinically, but when we do, it's really important to identify and treat aggressively as these patients can have serious morbidity and mortality um, from uh, this physiologic, uh, pathophysiologic response. So post-obstructive diuresis, what is it? Um, post-obstructive diuresis is essentially exactly what the name says, right? So we had a urinary tract obstruction, we decompress that obstruction, and then all of a sudden the kidneys start pouring out huge volumes of urine. So it's a polyuric state, right? And there is copious amounts, emphasis on copious, uh, of salt and water excretion. So what exactly, you know, are we talking about here? Um, well, the defining parameter, so the formal definition that has been agreed upon is either more than 200 cc's per hour of urine output for the, fir for the first two consecutive hours or greater than three liters of urine put out over the first 24 hours. And I will tell you that clinical case that we just talked about, that gentleman actually put out 11 it was like something like 11.5 liters of urine in the first six hours after he was decompressed. So you can have huge volumes of urine uh, that come out from post-obstructive diuresis. All right. How often do we see post-obstructive diuresis? So the true incidence is highly variable because there's kind of differing severities as we've seen. Anywhere from 0.5 to 52% of patients develop post-obstructive diuresis after relief you know, after decompression of their obstruction, right? But there's both physiologic and pathologic post-obstructive diuresis. And what we're interested in is pathologic post-obstructive diuresis. So the definition gets a little bit challenging, but a, I think it's safe to say that a rare percentage of patients develop severe post-obstructive diuresis, whereas less severe post-obstructive diuresis is probably a little more common. Why do we care? Well, these patients are at huge risk for dehydration, given all the fluid they're pouring out. They're at huge risk for electrolyte imbalances that can be lethal. They can go into hypovolemic shock from the significant and severe fluid shifts and can have significant morbidity and mortality because of that. Why do we develop post-obstructive diuresis? Well, for that, I, uh, all right, let's do it. I wasn't going to draw the nephron, but, you know, I'm too tempted now. Let's draw it. Hopefully, I can do this on the fly here in a reasonable amount of time. So we're going to draw a nephron. We have the proximal convoluted tubule into the thick descending, into the loop of Henle, into the thick ascending, into the proximal convoluted, distal convoluted, and collecting duct. That'll probably work. All right. Yeah, look at that. So we had our proximal convoluted tubule, right? This is our thick descending. This is our loop of Henle. All right, here's our thick ascending. Our um, distal convoluted tubule and our collecting duct. Um, what is going on in obstructive uropathy? So obstructive uropathy, as we talked about in the last video, I'll link both those videos in the uh, video description as well as in the top right corner. So check them out because um, we do a lot of kind of the background of this video in those. So, right, your urine is flowing through here and there's a bunch of transporters on its way out of the body. So, right, that's excreted out of the body. When we have obstruction, you obviously aren't excreting, right? And you get kind of back pressure flow 
of the urine in the opposite direction. Then all of a sudden, you just release this obstruction and all your urine can flow back out. All that urine that's been obstructed for who knows how many days can flow out of your body, urine output. Well, the physiologic and pathologic changes that occur to try to maintain some level of regulation don't change back as quickly, right? So you are stuck with kind of the nephron physiology being the physiology to try to preserve functionality in the setting of obstruction and urinary retention that is just reversed immediately, but it takes time for those changes to revert back. So what are those changes? Well, primarily we have, right, in the thick ascending, which I'm going to erase this just to give us a little more room, we have the sodium chloride for pumping out sodium chloride into the interstitium. And the distal convoluted then, water follows, right? And that takes salt and water out of the urine. You then get down to the collecting duct, and usually what you have is ADH inserting into the collecting duct, then pumps more H2O out. Well, when you have your obstructive uropathy, these things are not occurring, right? Because number one, you start to be less responsive to ADH. So you do not have as many ADH receptors, uh, ADH uh, porins that are allowing water to come out. You have dysregulation of your sodium chloride transporters and thus you are not pumping water out of the distal convoluted tubule into the interstitium. And then you actually have increase ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide levels, which lead to more excretion of sodium chloride with water following in the distal or in the collecting duct. So you have um, ANP makes the body in the setting of fluid overload hold on to, I worded this poorly, let's reword that. So atrial natriuretic peptide, in the setting of obstructive uropathy, the body feels fluid overloaded, right? Because you're getting this backflow and you're not able to excrete urine or fluid, so the body feels fluid overloaded. So increasing atrial natriuretic peptide levels suppress the reabsorption of sodium chloride and then subsequently water because the body thinks that you don't want more fluid in the intravascular space and you want to urinate it out, but you can't urinate it out. But nonetheless, A&P tries to increase the amount you're urinating out to help with fluid overload. So all of those things essentially lead to increased sodium chloride, increased H2O in the nephron. And then again, you will release that obstruction and all of a sudden you have all of these things that are freed up to pour out salt and water and you just start diuresing huge huge volumes so with that in mind how do we manage this what is the management of post-obstructive diuresis well it seems probably fairly obvious because you're addressing these different things right so obviously if you're having pathologic huge volume post-obstructive diuresis, you want the patient to be in the ICU because they're going to need hourly urine outputs, probably every four hour BMP mag fosses, and then actually urine sodium can be valuable too, okay? You want to replace about half to three-fourths, depending on the source you talk about, of the urine output lost with 0.45% normal saline. The reason for this is because you're at high risk for hypernatremia because you're losing all of this free water, right? If we think about it, this uh, inability to respond to ADH is almost like diabetes insipidus, right? You can't reabsorb that free water through ADH uh, porins unless you're dumping out a bunch of free water. I know you're also dumping out sodium and chloride, but the amount of free water you're dumping out specifically because you're not responding to ADH kind of outweighs the amount of sodium chloride you're losing as well. So you're at high risk for hypernatremia, which is why you want 0.45% 
normal saline. Now, obviously, you want to look at their basic metabolic panel and their sodium and chloride and adjust accordingly. Why don't you want to just do one-to-one -one repletion of fluids, right? Why do you want to just give half to three-fourths of the urine output back intravascularly? Well, for unknown reasons, we actually see that giving too much IV fluid worsens or prolongs the amount of post-obstructive diuresis. Now, I, I couldn't find any good source that explained why this occurred, but if you give back high volumes of fluid, you actually can worsen the post-obstructive diuresis and prolong the post-obstructive diuresis. So this is kind of, you know, what they feel like maybe a, a happy medium, for lack of a better word, is just replacing, you know, 50% to 75% of the urine output lost. And again, watch the patient's blood pressure, other uh, signs of end organ perfusion and make sure you're not getting super behind. But assuming hemodynamically and perfusion wise, they're doing okay, just replace 50% to 75%, use 0.45% normal saline. The last management point, and it's one that uh, there's not kind of firm agreement on, is whether you should be clamping the Foley. What does that mean? So this patient, you know, let's say they have a complete, you know, bladder outlet obstruction, you place the Foley and decompress them, and they just start dumping fluid out. Well, the old adage used to be to clamp the Foley catheter intermittently to not allow them to urinate as much. Newer studies suggest that that is actually not efficacious, but there's a caveat to that. The uh, clamping Foley studies typically look at kind of the immediate acute phase, not how prolonged the post-obstructive diuresis is, you know, how many hours or days it occurs for, but whether they have any morbidity in that acute right off the bat phase. And a morbidity is, you know, some people can develop spontaneous hematuria, some people can get kind of vagal responses and Brady down, some people can get uh, tremendously hypotensive acutely. And studies showed that clamping the Foley did not help those things, but there's still kind of no consensus on whether clamping the Foley kind of helps more subacutely over the, you know, 12 hours to days. So at our institution, some of our nephrologists will recommend intermittent Foley clamping. Um, and some of the parameters they sometimes give are if the patient is putting out more than four liters per day to intermittently clamp the Foley. Um, other nephrologists will say we don't need to clamp the Foley. So there's no consensus on that. Um, I think it is falling out of favor in general, but there are still some places that would recommend Foley clamping um, to try to decrease the amount of urine output being produced. All right, so interesting case. Again, check out that case conference number one, um, as well as the obstructive uropathy uh, video. And then this is the management of a really interesting complication of post-obstructive diuresis. Uh, the patient that we had that we talked about in the case conference went to the intensive care unit, uh, continued to have significant diuresis, uh, urinating huge volumes for like a day or two. They did get a little hypernatremic um, as well. Um, all that was fixed. Our nephrologist did recommend some intermittent clamping since they're still having high volumes. They eventually were transitioned from the intensive care unit to the floor and uh, sent home in a couple of days and they did okay. Their renal function uh, went from a BUN of 156 and a creatinine of 22 down to a, uh, what was there? I think their final BUN was maybe like 25 and their creatinine was 1.2 or something like that. So had a really impressive recovery recovery and renal function. All right. Thank you for watching. Let us know questions, comments, thoughts, concerns you have down below. Again, feel free to hit that subscribe button in the bottom right corner over here. Check out our Patreon page. Check out our other videos. We appreciate you watching. Stay well, and we'll see you all next time.